Okay. So, um, my name is Kasha Patana, and I'm a um, Google Product Manager and Google Reagents Product Manager with uh, uh, MDS Analytical Technologies, formerly the Molecular Devices, and I would like to introduce to you our speakers today. Um, Carol Crittenden is uh, our Application Scientist here at MDS Analytical Technologies. She has been with the company for over seven years now, working with Flipper and all the reagents and uh, related applications. She has previous uh, experience in cancer research and, uh, and biotechnology. Eugene Becker um, is our uh, the senior scientist from Pfizer that will be um, speaking to us today about um, their evaluation of um, two ion channel targets. Um, Eugene uh, is working in the primary, uh, primary uh, pharmacology group at Pfizer on global research and development in the Sandwich, UK. Um, he's involved in development and optimization of uh, plate-based assays uh, to support um, high speed and structure um, um, and screening um, programs for the pain research unit. And then uh, Luke Armstrong, and uh, Dr. Luke Armstrong, um, he's joining us from Militor. And um, Luke is a manager of the GPCR product development uh, lab in the drug discovery unit of Militor. He's been with the company for almost seven years. And he started previously with the Chemicron, which was then acquired by Militor in 2006. So with that, I will um, give it away to Carol, who will um, um, tell you about her, um, some of her data. Good morning. This is Carol Crittenden. And I wanted to introduce to you the um, Flipper um, Calcium 5 kit. We're going to kind of start this morning by taking a look at the current calcium mobilization assay domain. And then we're going to take a look at what's new and what remains the same. We're going to look at a little bit of data because I'm just going to kind of the introductory for um, Eugene and for Luke, and then we'll just kind of summarize our calcium kit offerings and move on into the next set of presentations. So the current calcium mobilization domain in, in uh, 2006, um, Molecular Devices introduced the Flipper Calcium 4 kit and um, with, with a, a new clincher, and um, it um, quickly became the uh, uh, gold standard, but uh, there have been some new competitive reagents on the market recently. And uh, now we are um, pleased to look to the future by introducing our uh, Calcium 5 kit, which I think as you can see here in the slide has some um, uh, significant uh, increase in signal window. And the Flipper Calcium assay kits have been out for over, uh, I think around nine, ten years now. And um, the uh, first calcium kit um, was the first reagent um, with a no-wash uh, calcium dye, and it utilizes a masking technology, which we've licensed from Bayer. Um, we are also the first 1536 calcium reagent, and we've um, optimized them and moved forward um, through the years and made some improvements. And so by increasing signal window and also becoming um, uh, better with the uh, chemokines and some other things. Um, just a quick review for um, if you, how the, the dye works. If you um, take a look at the diagram I've got there in red, um, when the ligand uh, binds with the GPCR in the surface of a cell, you've got a cascade of signaling messages that um, end up with the release of calcium within the cell. And what we've done is we've incubated the cells with a our dye complex, which includes the calcium sensitive dye as well as a masking agent um, to mask any nonspecific um, fluorescence from calcium. And so when the dye comes in contact with um, a calcium molecule within the cell, then it is, has the ability to fluoresce. So just a quick review there. And the kit that we had, I was talking about the blue quench kit, and then we um, moved on. Um, through another series, and we um, started with our Calcium 3 kit, and that was the first red quench technology. 
In the calcium-4 kit, um, we've improved the signal-to-background ratio, and also um, with the quench technology, we had less interference with serum, and it um, helped to expand our um, ability to see some targets. And now we'd like to um, talk to you some more about the calcium-5 kit, which has the same quench as the calcium-4 kit, but it has a novel indicator um, die, which gives a bigger signal window. So what remains the same? You can utilize the same assay protocol. Um, it's a homogeneous assay, has consistent pharmacology, and um, we've tested it on flipper, flex station, or in other similar radios that you're going to see today. But what's new? It has a superior performing calcium indicator technology, higher signal response, and uh, with that larger signal to noise, noise ratio, we can also have improved C factors. I just want to start out with giving a little bit of basic data. We, we took a look at some PREC-293 cells plus ATP, and you can see we've compared calcium-5 kit um, in the blue, calcium-4, and then a competitor kit in green, and you can see um, improved these factors here. So I'm looking at the data a couple of different ways. Um, I've just added down here we have the signal traces, and you can see here that we have a 4 to 1 um, signal to background ratio versus the other two, which are just a little over 3 to 1. And we also did some CHO M1 cells with acetylcholine, and we've compared calcium-5, calcium-4, calcium-3, and the competitor kit. And again, you can see the larger signal window with the calcium-5. We did an antagonist assay uh, with the CHO M1 cells, the muscarinic M1 receptor, and we used atropine as an antagonist is against all the kids as well. And you can see we've got some, again, good signal window. Um, and then another thing we did, and this is one of the things that is useful with a larger signal window, um, the first graph I have here has 10 nanomolar of acetylcholine versus the atropine antagonist um, with good Z factors of calcium-5. And we have a three uh, uh, signal window. And then we also did it with, um, 1.5 nanomolar acetylcholine, which is about an EC30 concentration. And as you can see, that graph isn't as pretty, um, but you do get enough um, delta F over F signal window with uh, Z factors. Here, in this case, it's 0.61 that um, you can use less than, um, so we can just show that you can use less than an EC80 concentration, which um, gets important for things like allosteric modulators and stuff like that. So um, just kind of to wrap up here where um, we have a novel indicator that provides that larger signal window. We have our proven quench technology from molecular devices plus the no wash system. And I've got uh, the kit comes in um, four configurations. Um, we have the Explorer kit, which is 10 vials, one plate each. Bulk kit, uh, which is 10 vials, 10 plates each. The Express kit. And then we also have a calcium evaluation kit that's available. And um, with that, I'm going to turn things over to Eugene to carry on. And thank you much. OK, um, so I'd like to spend the next uh, 20 minutes just sharing with you some data and some generous of the calcium side diet with two um, Einstein targets. Um, just a brief background. I'm going to start by a brief background in terms of um, what the primary pharmacology group does. And then I'll just discuss some data um, on the two targets. And then hopefully wrap up with a summary um, for Luke um, discussing his presentation. Okay, so um, briefly, um, in terms of the work we do within the group, it's a mix of plate based assay development to support um, HCF screens as well as some SAR work for our research projects. We also have cell culture and region provision teams um, providing us with fresh and crisis of cells, as well as membranes for um, certain biomassing. So I think it's already been mentioned um, certain, in terms of the data presented by Carol. Um, we also have to protect us out of it. So within the group, we have access to um, two Hamamatsu and SDSS 6000. Um, instruments for our CPCI and iron chunk targets. So, um, in, in the context of this webinar, um, our, our experience to date has been with the calcium core diet and the third quarter. Um, and I'm sure you'll appreciate there's a whole chapter of 
to some diet out on the market. So we certainly got involved in the evaluation of calcium by the CTF side. And um, before, um, before moving on to the data, I thought I'd just really wanted to clarify um, the data that will be reporting. So the data we typically report is ratio, which is captured um, quite neatly in this slide. So on the left hand side, we have um, a typical kinetic profile, so we have time and the relative to reference units. So when we're talking about ratio, we're essentially, um, if we take a given time point, we're dividing the baseline from that little region as highlighted there, which essentially resets the baseline to one and the max peak response at that given time point is 3.5. So essentially when we're talking about ratio data, um, the baseline has been um, essentially divided from the peak fluorescence count. Okay, moving on. So, the first um, trip channel I'm going to talk about um, is an expression of HEC 293 cell background. And in this experiment, the data I'm going to describe is head-to-head -head with the calcium 4 and calcium 5 dye. We took the opportunity to look at the effect of dilogen at room temperature versus 37 degrees, which is the current default um, protocol. And the response that's been measured were the, um, essentially the agonist response and the response of buffer, as well as an assessment of the um, Z prime. At the bottom of this slide is a brief description of the assay protocol. Um, and here we use an assay rate of frozen cells, um, which are plated overnight. And on the day of assay, the media is removed. And I just wanted to highlight this is our standard um, protocol for these assets where we remove the assay, so we remove the culture media. Dye loading, the dye is prepared as described in the product inserter, and we typically dye load for 60 minutes. The compound addition and reads are um, performed on the FDSA. Okay, so this first slide um, essentially on the um, left hand side talks about the assay response at room temperature with the calcium 4, a highlighted in blue, and the calcium 5 dye. And here we have the response with the buffer control. So it's certainly what's clear from this data set um, is we get a larger assay signal um, with the calcium 5 dye at room temperature. And here on the right hand side we see uh, a similar profile with our current um, default dilating condition which is the first 70 degree. So certainly for us um, this highlights um, there is potential scope with both dyes um, to dilate room temperature, but we're clearly seeing an increased assay signal with the calcium five dye. So moving on to the um, Z prime um, as I've highlighted previously, when the assays are on 37 degrees, we can have a very good dead prime, which is above 0.5. And that is maintained um, with the calcium 5 dye at 37 degrees as well as room temperature. Okay. So that first set was um, essentially just looking at some basic parameters. With the um, second ion channel target, um, we've done some more extensive work where we use a design of experiment approach to test factors such as um, cell density and the effect of preventative concentration on the um, agonist responses. This target is expressed in a choke cell background, and in this particular experiment, um, we were looking at calcium 4, calcium 5, and the fluid 4 direct. And I've stated previously the protocol and some of the assays as before for the target one. Um, so however, the dilating was performed at 37 degrees. So before moving on to the data, I'd like to spend a, a minute or so just to uh, explain the design of the experiments as opposed to an optimal approach. It's essentially a, a 
systematic procedure or methodology, um, that seeks to derive the maximum amount of information from the minimum set of experiments. Uh, I guess most of us are familiar with the multifactorial experiments. That is essentially the same thing. And this essentially um, involves running a combination of all factor levels so that a response model can be built. So in this particular example, um, our factors are time, which is where a response, in this case a max, has been um, decided at different time points. And the effect of um, self-entity has been assessed. What this enables the experiment to do is to um, identify the optimum conditions, as well as um, the opportunity to assess the stability of that optimum, so that one can arrive at a robust assay. Okay. So, um, what does our DOE data look like for the calcium side as well as the calcium four side? So, in this left-hand side, um, what we are essentially modeling is preventative from 0 to 2.5 millimolar. And on the X1 axis, we've got an um, increase in cell density. So, looking at the max response, um, what is clear is um, a dependence of preventative um, certainly for this dye and for this particular target. And as we increase the preventive concentration, we then increase in the um, max response. The other thing highlighted from this data is um, the response with the um, change in cell number is relatively stable. Um, so again, by performing this experiment, one has an idea of you know what the effect of varying cell numbers has on the assay signal. A similar profile is um, observed with a calcium 5 dye. And um, actually in the study, there is a suggestion um, that at a lower um, cell density, in this case 5,000, we're going to slightly high assay signal compared to the calcium 4 dye. So the, the key thing from this, this study was certainly for benefit to have an effect, and it's optimal um, at 1.5 millimolar. Okay, so having um, run the DOE to establish the key assay um, conditions or assay parameters, big part of this one too far ahead. So on this slide, um, as I say previously, we've then gone on to um, the comparison of the calcium 5 and the source board regulator. Um, so this is my target. What I really want to highlight was the suggestion that for benefit, at the various concentrations tested um, for the fluid direct had minimal impact on the assay signal. Um, furthermore, we get a lower assay signal with the fluid for direct dye um, compared to the calcium 4 and the calcium 5. So, having established um, the key assay parameters, the next step was to um, assess the pharmacology. And on this slide, um, the preventative concentration was fixed at 1.5 millimolar, and here we're evaluating the three different dyes with a fixed cell number. So as stated on the previous slide, we certainly did see a reduced um, assay signal with the so-called direct dye, with the calcium 5 in a slightly higher assay signal. But the key message is um, we, we certainly haven't seen a significant can shift in the agonist potency. So, to sum up, um, in terms of our testing with the two trip channels, um, we demonstrated an increased assay signal um, for the two targets. We have observed a good set prime, um, certainly for the first iron channel target. Similar profile has been seen with the second target. And in evaluating the um, agonist of um, certainly with calcium 5, we do not see a significant shift. Overall, the preliminary data um, that suggests the assays we're currently running with calcium 4 um, can be transitioned 
to come combine. I'm now going to enter and hand this presentation on to you. Okay, thank you very much, Eugene, and thanks, Katya, for having me. Today, I would like to tell you about Millipore's chemistry cell lines. Uh, these are GPCR-expressing cell lines that have been optimized for calcium assay. And I'd also like to tell you about some experiments that we've done to optimize these assays with MDS's new calcium 5 kit. And to give you some perspective of uh, Millipore's offerings in the GPCR arena, Millipore has a large portfolio of GPCR assays and services, um, most pertinent for today's discussion is that we have about 155 uh, GPCR calcium cell lines available, and we have a selection of these available as rated assay single-use uh, preparations. Uh, we also have membranes prepared from about 120 of these cell lines, and these are suitable for radioligand binding or GTPMS assays. And finally, we also offer our GPCR profiler service in which you can send us your compounds, and we can analyze them against as many or as few of these targets as you wish. Um, and we also now offer assays that are tailored for the detection of allosteric modulators through our allosteric profiler service, and we also offer uh, custom flex lab services. So our ChemiScreen uh, platform offers uh, several advantages. So Basically, we have a proprietary combination of an expression plasmid and a cell line that gets us optimal cell surface expression. So something that we had noticed in uh, trying to express GPCRs in some certain GPCRs in traditional cell lines, such as CHO, uh, for example, the CXCRQ here, is that we get a large amount of intracellular retention of the, the GPCR. However, when we've expressed used our, our uh, proprietary PHS vector in uh, our proprietary CHEM1 cells, we get a large proportion of the receptor being expressed on the cell surface. And so this leads to a uh, more functional receptor being expressed on the cell surface, and we've uh, been using these largely in a, in a stable format for more consistent results. And another advantage of our system is that are, we've been using cell lines that are endogenously expressing G-alpha-15 or G-alpha-16 to couple diverse uh, GPCRs to the calcium pathway, and we've been able to get probably about 80% uh, of, of the GPCRs that we've looked at um, that are coupled to uh, GS or to GI uh, to couple to the calcium pathway. Um, just with the endogenous. Um, some of the other uh, ones we've had to use a, a uh, recombinant promiscuous uh, GP, uh, G protein. And so just to highlight the reason why this is important, um, if you want to profile a compound on a particular family of receptors with different coupling statuses, it can be a challenge. For example, the, the prostanoid receptor family here uh, consists of GS, GI, and GQ coupled receptors. So if you want to look at compounds in each receptor in its native pathway, you'd have to set up three different assay formats, uh, a direct analysis of cyclic AMP for a GS-coupled receptor, um, inhibition of force bone induced cyclic AMP for a GI-coupled receptor, and then a calcium assay uh, for GQ-coupled ones. And with the chemi-screen cell lines, uh, we get a single readout, and we can analyze all of these receptors uh, with a, a simple calcium assay. And our cell lines are optimized for HDS. Uh, here are some example calcium assay data for the EP2 prostanoid receptor. Uh, this uh, assay is done on the, the flipper tetra, and as you can see, it's got a, a good high signal and a very nice Z prime in the 384 well format. And one more thing that we've recognized is the, the trend towards uh, um, having cell-based assays uh, being made much more screen-friendly if they can be frozen in large quantities and thawed into assay plates for assaying the next day. And here's some example data showing that uh, frozen, at, frozen cells um, assay the day after thawing um, can be, that's the, the RTA here, uh, 
are pretty comparable in signal and to EC50 to continuous culture cells. Uh, that's the, the CC right here. And, of course, the main topic of our discussion today is your choice of the calcium assay method. Um, so there's a number of different options. And um, we have uh, tested a number of different no-wash calcium assay kits from different vendors. Um, and we've obtained good results for, with all of them. And for all the data that I've shown you so, up to this point, uh, we've taken the approach of removing the plating media and replacing it with an assay buffer that's usually uh, HPSS, and that contains the no-wash dye. And so now the, the newer option is to further simplify the assay and increase throughput by adding the dye directly to the cells in the plating media and performing a loading in the assay in the presence of the serum-containing media. However, there are some considerations that we wanted to make um, before making the switch uh, from assaying and buffer to assaying and media with serum. First is the question of whether to use probenicid. And we have usually used probenicid in our no-wash assays, um, and so we are curious about how probenicid influences the assay in the presence of media. Second, we wanted to compare the available technologies for the non-media removal assays and to see how MDS's new calcium-5 compares to the alternatives. And last but not least is the issue of whether ligands with different uh, physiochemical properties uh, differ when they're assayed in buffer or in media, and we had particular concerns about uh, protein ligands, uh, such as chemokines, and also with lipid ligands, uh, in particular prosthenoids and sphingosine 1-phosphate. Um, in this first experiment, we used our CXDR4 receptor cell line with or without 2.5 millimolar probenicid, and the assay kits that were used were either MDS's calcium-5 or calcium-4, as well as Invitrogen's flow-4 direct, and um, these were all done in the presence of, of the plating media, and we also compared that to the calcium-5 kit done with the media removed and replaced by HBFS for, for loading and assay. And here we, we noticed uh, in the top panel is that in the presence of probenicid, all of the assays could give good signals in comparable EC50s. Um, calcium-5 in the presence of media gave us a stronger signal than all the assays, and that was even better than, than calcium-5 with assay and buffer. Um, However, we noticed that there was a pretty strong effect of probenicid here, and basically uh, there was absolutely no signal when the assay was performed in media with any of the kits um, in the absence of probenicid. But, however, removing the media did reveal a signal for, for calcium-5, and um, so it's clear, quite clear what, that we would need to use probenicid uh, to assay in the presence of media, and all the subsequent experiments that I'm going to show you were done with probenicid, and um, I'm not quite sure why uh, media would have such a, a strong effect on this. It might have something to do with the uh, cell surface expression of the organic anion transporter that uh, probenicid inhibits. So we took a look at another chemokine receptor, this time CXCR1, expressed in our Chem1 cells. And again, we found that the calcium-5 had the best signal, and there's no, really no difference in assaying in media or buffer here. And the EC50 values were pretty comparable across the assays. Um, one thing that we noticed uh, with some receptors more than others, and you can see with CXCR1, is that in when the in the presence of media uh that the onset of the, the peak was earlier and uh the decline of the signal was quite a bit quick, quicker um in this case and with, in most cases it didn't seem to have much effect on the, the pharmacology but it's just something to note and moving on to uh, prosthenoid receptors, uh, we took a look at the EP2 and EP3 receptors for prostaglandin E2. And for EP2, up here on the top, 
we observed that the calcium 5 dye gave us the, the strong, highest signal, and the signal was higher in the presence of buffer than in media, uh, in red there. Um, however, we saw something opposite with EP3, uh, which is that, again, calcium 5 gave the highest signal, but this time running the assay in media, as you can see in red, gave a higher signal than assaying uh, with media removed in the presence of buffer in blue. And I'm not sure what's responsible for these differences between the receptors uh, in assaying and media buffer. It might have to do with variations in receptor on the cell surface and the different solutions. But in any case, the EC50s were comparable. And so we conclude that the hydrophobic nature of, of this ligand, at least for prostaglandin E2, does not pose any special problems. Um, although I probably recommend looking at this carefully for all other members of the, the prostanoid family, as there can be some differences in the, um, in the characteristics of, of this class of ligands. We also took a look at the a peptide receptor, um, the glucagon receptor, this time expressed in chem1 cells as well. Um, and again, notice that there was consistent potency for, for all the assays, and again, calcium-5 gave us the, the highest signal, and we saw the better result in the presence of media um, than with the medium removed for calcium-5. And finally, to move on to our, probably our toughest ligand to work with, is the sphingosine 1-phosphate receptors. And something that we noticed here was, and I have to say that we've uh, found sphingosine 1-phosphate to be a particularly tricky ligand to work with because of its uh, strong hydrophobic nature. And uh, we definitely found a, a difficulty here. Um, and we found for, that for all three of the F1P receptors that we looked at, that assaying and buffer in the curves in blue um, gave us about a five-fold more potent EC50 than the values than the assays in media, and um, most likely what uh, we think is going on is that S1P is binding to a component in the serum, um, either albumin or, or perhaps to lipoproteins. Um, also, S1P is known itself to occur in serum, and so the, the serum-derived S1P might be causing a certain amount of desensitization. But... Um, Still, you can see that uh, in the presence of, of media, when the assay is done, that calcium-5 uh, did give us the highest signal in all of the cases. So that was good to see. And we also noticed a um, the trend that I mentioned about in the raw traces, that in the presence of serum, that uh, the peak seems to occur quite early and then declines. Um, very rapidly, whereas in the absence of serum, just in buffer, the, the peak uh, is slightly delayed, but is, is quite prolonged, and that uh, could be consistent with uh, binding, a uh, slower phase binding of the ligands to a component in the serum. So, we can draw a few conclusions about running the calcium assays on chemi-screen GPCR cell lines. Um, first of all, is that we observed a robust signal in the non-media removal format for all the cell lines examined, although uh, the targets, even within the same family, uh, differed in whether media removal or uh, non-media removal formats gave us a higher signal. Um, we were happy to see that chemokine, prostanoid, and peptide receptors, uh, at least the ones that we analyzed here, displayed comparable EC50 values in both the media removal and the non media removal format. Um, however, the S1P receptors were a special case, and they exhibited right-shifted EC50 values in the presence of media. Uh, this is likely due to the S1P ligands uh, binding to albumin or some other component in the serum containing media. Um, among the, the non media removal kits, uh, calcium 5 yielded the highest signal with all the receptors that we looked at. And probenicid was necessary to obtain a signal with any of the non-media removal kits, 
Um, however, it wasn't entirely necessary with in the media removal format as saying in buffer, although we have not yet looked quite as carefully as Eugene at the um, different concentrations of probenicid. And finally, the kinetics of the calcium response differed somewhat with format. The non media removal assays gave us an earlier peak response, but a faster decline than media removal assays done in the presence of buffer. Um, and so that's all that I have, and I will hand the um, speaker back over to Katya. Yeah, I believe you are muted at this time. All right. So I will unmute myself and uh, say again thank you to uh, Eugene and Luke. And uh, um, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us. We do have a few questions. Um, so uh, we want to encourage all of you to evaluate our new Flicker Casting Files kit. We do have sample kits available, and those are available through your uh, sales representative. Uh, we also have a, a sale going on for a 15% discount that's available through the end of October. Um, so for your questions, um, please submit your questions through the chat box or the question box, and you can either submit them to all participants or you can just send them to myself, the host, or, uh, or any of the panelists, and we will uh, answer them as we get the questions. So, so far, uh, I've received a few questions. Um, first one was about the recording of the webinar and availability of this presentation. Um, so, the webinar has been recorded, and, uh, and the, I will send out the link to all of those who have registered. I will send out the link of where um, you can listen to the webinar again if you were not able to listen to the entirety, uh, entirety of the webinar or if you want to pass it on to your colleagues, um, you will have that link. And also we will have the PDF available if uh, so you can request that either from your sales rep or, um, uh, or from myself. You should have my email and then press up at moldov.com uh, with the, the webinar instructions. The other question that we had, um, and that was uh, when Eugene was presenting, uh, but I think all of you can comment on this, is um, is one hour of dye loading necessary? Can it be decreased? And how long can the cells be loaded before they become ill? So Eugene, why don't you um, start out if you want to comment? Have you guys evaluated it? And, and then Luke and Carol, feel free to um, um, I believe yes, it can be reduced. I mean, obviously, this will be dependent on your target or cell line, you know, in terms of the expression levels and so on. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is also dye concentration as well. So, after some of it can say to 30 to 60 minutes. Again, it depends on how you want to run the assay. So, in the HTS scenario, one person would want to test um, how far you can push that dilating time as well. So certainly time and concentration, there is an influence in time and concentration. I don't know if um, Luke or Carol have any comments you want to add. So this is Carol. Um, I can also um, kind of talk about what we learned during our beta testing. Um, the experiments that I showed were done with a 45-minute um, dilate time at 37 degrees. Um, and then 15 minutes at room temperature. And then we have many customers, particularly suited, um, as Eugene was speaking about, in the long term or the high throughput group where they've got a lot of plates, where they die load um, at room temperature for one hour and in many cases up to two hours at room temperature and it works just fine. So Luke, have you got any comments on that? Yeah, I can say that we haven't uh, looked at too much less than, than one hour of dye loading, but we've uh, certainly kept cells in uh, at room temperature for up to two hours and have found that the signal is, does not seem to be compromised too much. Okay, great. 
Um, we do have quite a few questions that have come in. So the next question would be uh, from the Pfizer talk. Is it believed that 5,000 cells per well is optimal, or is it even uh, is uh, even lower density uh, preferable? Um, I think there may be scope to possibly use the that. I know I use this tend to during the side of caution. Um, the question would be how, so if you're running an assay and you're trying to see the 5,000 cells per well, you know, how reproducible are you going to see in that 5,000 from day to day? So, I mean, I certainly have data with um, other targets where um, you can push the cell number down, but, you know, the user tends to earn a side of caution and will go for a midpoint. Okay, thank you. Um, the other question that we have is, in terms of your medicinal chemist, are they at all worried that you have serum present in your buffer during screening? Maybe look if, uh, I don't know if you want to address that one. Yeah, I, I would certainly uh, have some concern about uh, serum being present. It would probably depend on the, the nature of the, the compounds. If you know that you're working with hydrophobic compounds or ones that are going to interact with a serum component, then, um, then that would be a particular concern. Um, it seems like uh, hydrophilic compounds tend to do fairly well. Um, another question that we have is, uh, have you observed any absence of signal in the presence of preventative with head cells compared to throat cells? Um, this is Luke again. Yeah, I, we haven't looked uh, specifically at, at Heck and Cho, um, but we, we do, as, as standard practice, use uh, ProBenefit with, with our Heck and Cho cells, the cell lines that we do have in that background. And I believe that's the same practice for us. So you to the people is 2.5 millimeter for benefit. So this is Carol, and we've we've seen a number of people with hex cells. Some people do use for benefit, and some people do not use it. And I think it kind of depends on target and preference. Okay. Um, we have one more question. Actually, we have a couple more questions, but. Um, has anyone tried this in 1536 well format? It appears to remove the need to remo for removal of the media and is therefore homogeneous. What volumes would you want to mix together in 1536? Is there a dilution factor of the chip with your media in the well? Carol, maybe you can comment on that one. Oh, yeah, I can. Um, so with the 1536 um, typically, well, I mean, it depends on, again, there's many ways to do it, but um, typically there's um, about four microliters of media, and if you're not removing it, because it's really difficult to do in 1536, um, I've done it a couple of different ways. Um, I have either um, used a uh, pipetter to take off a couple of microliters, not, not, wa not a wash step, but I've actually used the tetra to remove a couple of microliters of media and then added in equal volumes of dye, uh, which is similar for the 96 and 384 well format. The other thing I've done is um, used four microliters of culture medium and then actually concentrated the dye a little bit um, rather than making it up um, at the, the regular concentration. I've concentrated it and added, like, instead of four microliters of dye, I've added two microliters of dye. And then when I come back in with agonist, then I would add, like, um, one microliter of 7X um, and agonist, and then you could adjust accordingly for an antagonist assay. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that question was the particular for screening mode, but I, uh, I know that for... Uh, for well, now, I think Calc5, we, uh, we have not done extensive testing in 1536. Um, um, again, we have worked with uh, a number of uh, data customers to evaluate it, but I don't know that we have any data available currently in 1536 mode. Um, another question that we had, uh, has anyone tried primary cells? Um, and the answer to that would be yes, one of our uh, beta customers has. Uh, I don't believe that we can release that data, um, but um, I don't know if Carol would want to add any comments to, to that. Um, yeah, there, 
there was we, we have had one of our customers did do some some testing with um, some uh, blood cells and um, found some good uh, good data. In fact, they were able to get it in assay that with the calcium five dye that they were not able to get at um, with the other dyes. And unfortunately, we can't release much more than that. But uh, they were quite pleased. Okay, um, I think um, that uh, pretty much concludes our um, questions um, that we've had so far. So if you had any other questions uh, that we did not get to, uh, please feel free to email us or check with your, um, your local sales rep, and uh, we'll be happy to, again, to provide you with a sample kit. And uh, again, thank you very much to Eugene and, and Luke uh, for sharing their data with us um, today. And uh, I will release this uh, webinar recording as soon as, I, um, as soon as it's available. I think that will conclude our webinar. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. Uh, um, and we look forward to hearing from you and uh, hearing your thoughts on the calcium file.